Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write the game engine from scratch. After having completed the implementation of render items, we have got almost everything in place in order to render our geometry. We are now able to send the geometry data to the GPU and tell it which shaders should be used to render each submesh that belongs to that geometry. In addition, we need to send view and projection matrices, as well as model to world transform matrix of each object to the GPU. This is needed to position the objects relative to each other in world space and place them in view as seen by the selected camera. This data is updated and sent to the GPU during each frame. To make this easier, we are going to add a constant buffer class which contains a buffer resource that's mapped to the system memory. It also acts as a linear stack allocator that's emptied after each frame. Before we start, I'd like to do a couple of small improvements to the code we wrote in the last episode. In this frame cache, we don't have to copy the thresholds because we already have this array in the frame info, which we get as a function parameter, so it can be removed. And we can simply use the one in frame info. I'm also fixing the comments here to give the correct description of what's going into the render items buffer. And the last improvement is to move the low-level render item struct into the CPP file, because it's not going to be used by anyone else. Now we can start writing the buffer resource classes. I'll start off by creating a class that represents a buffer resource. We have been creating buffer resources before using the create buffer helper function. This class simply encapsulates a few properties of such a buffer. I'll define an init info structure to provide the parameters for creating the buffer resource. We'll add the parameters in a minute, but first let's continue with this buffer class. We disable copying class instances because it holds a pointer to the resource which should have a unique owner. This is just a rule in this game engine, of course. Technically, you can have as many copies as you want, as long as you can handle the lifetime of the objects deterministically. In addition to the resource pointer, we keep the GPU virtual address of the buffer, which is a 64-bit number that represents a location in GPU memory. We also remember the size of the buffer. Now, because we disabled copy operations, we have to explicitly write the move operations. So we need to write the move constructor and the move assignment operator. Starting with the move constructor, we simply assign the member variables and reset the instance that was moved into this new instance. This transfers the ownership of the resource pointer to the new instance. The move assignment operator checks if we are not trying to move an instance into itself and if that's not the case, releases the current instance and moves the other one into this one. Moving is done by copying the member variables and resetting the other instance. We also define a destructor which calls release. Next I'll add a few accessor functions to get the buffer, GPU address and the size of the buffer. Before implementing the constructor that creates the buffer, I need to finish defining the init info structure for buffer resources. It's similar to the one we use for creating textures, so I'll copy and modify from texture init info. Like textures, we can choose to place a newly created buffer resource in an existing heap, initialize it with data, if any, 
set its initial state and provide some flags to indicate the usage of the buffer. We also need to provide a size. And for structured buffers, we have to give the stride or element size and the number of elements in the buffer. This is not needed for constant buffers though. In addition, we always need a buffer alignment value. And finally, we can determine whether an unordered access view should be created for the buffer. This is something we'll need in a later video when we write a structured buffer class. In the constructor, we check if we have non-zero size and alignment, and obviously buffer pointer should be no. Before creating the buffer, we need to align this size up to be a multiple of the alignment. The problem is, however, that we can only call this function with an alignment given in this template argument. Because we can't know this alignment in advance, we can't provide it as a constant anymore and therefore we need to write non-template versions of these alignment functions. Let me first tidy up this code while we are here. Just adding no discard and reformatting for consistency. Now we can write the alignment functions. This is rather trivial and we can do it by simply adding an extra function parameter, replace the static assertions with assert macro, and use const instead of const expert. Great, now we can create a buffer using the init info and the aligned size. We get the GPU virtual address of the created buffer and give the buffer a name as well. Note that I'm using the aligned size, which could be different from the size that the caller provided. It's your choice which size you would like to include in the debugging information. Next, we'll write the release function. It releases the buffer resource and resets the other member variables. I need to change how this assertion message is used first before building the engine. This is it for the basic buffer class. I'll write the constant buffer class next. This class is intended as a manager for a buffer which is used to transfer data to the GPU during each frame. It acts as a linear stack allocator which is reset after every frame. Because we want to transfer data from system memory to GPU memory, the buffer will need to be CPU accessible and I'd like to make it so that it can be used by multiple threads at the same time. Because of that, we'll need a mutex as a member variable, and the problem with mutex is that it can't be copied or moved, which makes sense if you think about it. Therefore, I'll disable copy and move operations for this class. Doing so actually makes it easier for us, since now we don't have to write any copy or move operations. We only need a destructor that releases the resources. We use the basic buffer class that we just finished writing as the internal buffer. In addition, we need to keep the CPU mapped address of the buffer and an offset which indicates how much of that buffer is in use. As I mentioned, we need a mutex for synchronization. In the release function, we release the buffer and reset everything else to zero. We can also clear the buffer by simply setting the CPU offset back to zero. There is an allocate function that reserves a part of the buffer and returns a pointer to that part. We can also have a template function that allocates room for any given data type. And we have the same accessors as for the basic buffer class, except now we have an extra accessor for the CPU address. In addition, I'll write a function that returns the GPU virtual address of any allocated block within the buffer. 
In order to do so, we first lock the buffer and get the raw CPU address of the allocated block by simply casting the address to U8 type. Then we check if this pointer is within the address range of the buffer, and if so, we can calculate its offset with respect to the start of the buffer. We can calculate the GPU virtual address by simply adding this offset to the GPU virtual address of the buffer. For convenience, I'll also add a static function that returns the default init info for this type of buffer. It's again not that complicated. We pass the size of the buffer, and because this is a constant buffer, we need to align it according to the requirements for data placement within constant buffers. This constant is defined as 256, which means that each allocated block within the buffer has a size that's a multiple of 256 bytes. Next, we are going to implement the constructor, after fixing a couple of typos. The internal buffer is created using the init info, and as I mentioned, it should be CPU accessible. That's why the second parameter is set to true. We can change the name of the buffer resource using our accessor functions. We need to map the buffer resource to CPU accessible memory next. This will give us the CPU address of the mapped resource. The last function that we need to write is the function that allocates a block of memory in the buffer. Of course, we need the size for the block that we want to allocate, and we need to align it to be a multiple of constant buffer data placement alignment, which is 256 bytes. I'm going to quickly write a helper function for aligning sizes for constant buffers. And while we are at it, we can also write one for data alignment for texture resources, although we are not going to use it yet. Back in the allocate function, we align the size and check if it still fits within the buffer. If that's the case, we return the address to the current offset and increase the offset for the next allocation. If there wasn't enough room left in the buffer, we return no. And that completes the code for the constant buffer class. Now we can use it in the Direct3D renderer. I'd like to have a constant buffer that's globally accessible to submodules within the renderer. So I'll start by adding an accessor function for that in the core header file. In core.cpp, I'm going to add an array of constant buffers. The reason for it being an array is that we need the data in the constant buffer to be available during an entire frame of rendering, and since we are doing asynchronous rendering using multiple frame buffers, we need to have as many constant buffers as the number of frame buffers. <laughs> 
This way we can write data to the buffer for the next GPU frame, while the GPU is reading from the buffer for the current frame, if that makes sense. We can create the buffers during initialization, and because we can't copy or move this class, we are going to use placement new to create instances. So for each frame buffer, we are going to create a constant buffer with the size of one megabytes. Of course, we still need to think of a way to resize this when we need a larger buffer, but for now this will have to do. We also change the name of the buffer to global constant buffer. When shutting down the renderer, we release all constant buffers. And here is the exceptionally complicated implementation of the accessor function for constant buffers. At the beginning of each frame, we get a reference to the constant buffer for the current frame and clear it. Now it's ready to be used for transferring data to the GPU. In the next video, we are going to look at how we can send the view and projection matrices to the GPU. We are also going to collect all data that's needed to render the objects in a cache for the GPass. As always, thank you for joining me today and I hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time, until then take care and happy game engineering!